Namaste, 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 everyone. Let's start with the mantra. Poonamida, poonamidam, poonat poonamudachite, poonasya poonamadaya, poonameva bashishate. And it means, this is full that also is full. This fullness came from that fullness. Though this fullness came from that fullness, that fullness remains forever full. Om Shanti, Shanti, Shanti. The reason I started with that particular mantra, we are talking about meditation. And in meditation, we're talking about the real meaning of yoga, which is to unite the lower self with the higher self. And that mantra says very clearly, we all come from one. This is full, that also is full. We came from that. And even though we came from that, we take nothing away because it is always full and we are part of that fullness. And we seem to forget this constantly. We get distracted by so many thoughts and society, the world, the news, everything pulls us outwards. So even though we are meditating, the mind is still out there. Because the most important thing before you start is why are you doing this? What for? Connection to the highest. What do you want from life? Be really clear. You are what your deep driving desire is says the Upanishads. What you desire, so you will get and you will become. So when you sit and meditate, know why. That's the first thing you must know. What is your goal? If your goal is, I want to meditate because I want more money, etc., you will get it. There's no no doubt, if that's what you want, if you meditate on anything long enough, you're going to get what you want. But is that what you want? You need to ask yourself, what do I really want? So we get jammed by all these thoughts because society people, our friends tell us, no, you have to want this and you have to be like this. You've got to be real. You live in the world. You've got to be practical. Nobody is telling you not to be practical. We need money to survive. We need to pay bills. I have to run a home. I have to pay bills. I know we're human. Nobody's saying that you shouldn't want those things, but don't allow them to control you because the moment they control you, your meditation suffers. It just suffers. When you are angry with someone, your meditation suffers. When you're full of jealousy, your meditation suffers. When you're full of pain, your meditation suffers suffers. So I'd like to uh, read a quote from Rumi today that I just picked up. With life a short, life with life as short as a half taken breath, don't plant anything else but love. It's short like a half taken breath. I can surely tell you this is real. I remember being 15, 16 and suddenly I'm 66. I keep saying it, where did the years go? I still feel 15, 16, you know? But the years have gone and every day will be my last. <laughs> and I'm not scared of that too. But the practice of meditation, the practice of my faith, 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 you got it? Faith. Build up your faith. How do you build up your faith? Well, when things go wrong, actually, it's such an advantage. <laughs> because when they go wrong, that's your test. Do you have faith or not? Do you fall apart when things go wrong? Or do you say, well, I know this is for my best. 
That is faith. Trust. To trust. Yes, Nelly, we can't trust anybody today. We just can't. You know, people don't tell the truth. I'm not asking you to trust that. I'm asking you to trust the highest source of love. And the highest source of love, oh, I read something today again, which I must express because it was so beautiful to me. It said, it's like, we are like, all of us are like this big bubbling soup with all the different ingredients in it. And we are the ingredients and we're churning and churning and churning. So what are we putting into that soup of the world, of our earth? So if I'm bitter and angry, what, what am I adding in? What seasoning am I adding in to my earth? Bitterness. But if I'm full of love and joy, what seasoning am I adding into my earth? And you expand your meditation from the word I to the word we. Yes, we talk about it. We all understand it. But yet when we sit down, goes back to the eye and the only thing can that shift that the only thing for me is to understand intellectually using your buddhi your intellect to understand where consciousness and as such as albert einstein said there is only one job for us to do is treat each other like family so if your brother and sister argues with you, it's hard to be with them. Except it's hard to be with them. But you don't have to debate it. You don't have to fight it. You just have to know it's hard to be with them. So what is the solution then? Well, they've come to disturb my peace. See how easily it's disturbed. <laughs> I don't have enough faith in myself that I can transcend it. Thank God they've come to test me. And thank God it's my sister and my brother and nobody else. Because I know they won't be as violent, I hope. <laughs> I hope. And then when you see it from that point of view, their negative thoughts or what they cause you will be bounced off you, bounced off you. I love them. Okay, they got crazy thoughts, that's their problem. <laughs> I try to talk to them, they don't want to hear me. Are you gonna break the wall? You gotta listen to me, you gotta hear my point of view. Drop it. Because the moment you don't drop it, and that's where the letting go, we call it, you know, Ishwara Pranidhanam, which is surrender to God, or surrender to the universe. I did my best, can't do any better. Now I want my peace, so I give the problem to you. And my peace, my job is to stay still. and know that I'm divine, but so is some other people who are giving me trouble. They just don't know. Because I know I have to be the bigger person. And when you will start to work like this with your thought patterns, on everything, your job, your life, your desires, what happens, all this, you start to become a little detached from all this. And this is why the Sutras of Sri Patanjali tells us two things are really important on this path. Practice, meditation, and practice, many other things, karma yoga, bhakti yoga, practice. And the second wing is non-attachment. So what happens in meditation many times? We practice, but we got the attachment. I am meditating. I want everything. It should be a great meditation. I've sat here 15 minutes and nothing is working for me. It's the attachment to having a good meditation. I'll tell you, I've been meditating for over 30 years now. There are some days it's really bad. I just sit there and I know I'm all over the place. Yet I look at the clock and it's one hour. How did that happen? But that's taken me 30 years of learning. Okay, and I just let it go. I just let it go, no big deal. Good days, bad days. But sitting and having that time is brilliant. No attachment to the 
results, okay? And the attachment draws us back. Draws us just there. Good meditation, great. No good meditation, great. I am doing it because my goal is peace. And I know this is going to get me there. Your faith. I know it. Nothing can stop me. I have learned the outside world cannot make me happy. Oh, yes, of course, it can make me temporarily happy, but it's not permanent. And then everything is going to go. We're going to die. They're going to die. Everything goes through the law of entropy. It is the way it is. You want to look at any other way else, you're lying to yourself. So if everything's going away anyway, you might as well enjoy what you got. That makes you want to meditate. That helps you. So focus on that. So I will start with the questions now. Question from Louise. Thank you, Louise, for the, for the subject matter. I've just been thinking about meditation. Melanie always describes her meditation so wonderfully. I just told you I had bad days too. <laughs> and how she enjoys her time with God. That I always do, even on a bad day, I must say. How an hour can pass without her noticing it. It sounds amazing, but my meditation is nothing like that. It's me concentrating, being distracted, coming back, chewing the cat off my lap, <laughs> noticing the pain in my hip, trying again, and maybe snatching a few moments when I feel full of peace. Sounds, oh, if you get a few moments full of peace you're doing really well really well don't judge it that's doing perfectly sometimes really useful thoughts and ideas come up that i don't want to lose by going back to meditation sometimes it feels like a chore i have to fit it into my busy life and i'm tempted to skip it so how do we move forward from my kind of muddling meditation to Melanie's version? <laughs> well, Melanie's version is, is not just to Melanie. You can easily do it. It's to believe in yourself. And the mind may seem muddling, all right? When you first start meditation, and I don't know why people don't say this enough, they really should tell you the truth. It is all thoughts. And in the beginning, again and again, you have to process those thoughts. So in the beginning, I found with my personal practice was purify my mind. Okay, so when I first started meditation, too many thoughts, too many judgments, too much of everything. So the first step is Pratipaksha Bhavana, learning to change those thoughts. That may take you up to 10 years, 15 years, 20 years. Who knows what may take you one day? I don't know. You have to do it. You know, sometimes karma is a really funny thing. You think, no expectations. Oh, it take me 10 lifetimes. And then suddenly you got it and you don't know how you got it. So be patient, be patient, no time limit. All right, that's the first thing. And all the muddling things come up. Do you know some of my best ideas have come when I've been meditating? It's like God talks to me. <laughs> And that's when I, my mind is not on the shopping or on the cooking or somebody said this to me or somebody said that to me. That happens when my mind is on just, I want to know you, God, you know. I love this. I just know when I sit, I feel love. And like Rumi said, that's the secret. Just feel love. So I always tell people, think of somebody you love or something you love so much that it elevates your soul and makes you want to sing. And once you've got that feeling of love, so the mind is quite empty then because it's only the outpouring of love. This is for me the, the great gift. You know, I read many stories of many masters and in the end, I have seen they may have started off as karma yogi, working and serving the world. They may have started off as a uh, jnana yogi. One, what, who am I, who am I, analyzing what is God, what is my position here, what is the universe, what is consciousness. But in the end, 
all of them end up with bhakti. Because when they discover that, that love from within, every single cell in our body changes. It changes. Whether you like it or not, it changes. Science is proving it now. They say if you smile a lot, the cells change. <laughs> Laughter therapy. If you are sick, laugh a lot. It makes a difference. When we're sick, we normally, uh, no, do the opposite. Watch something make you laugh, 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 laugh. Laughter therapy, love therapy. Okay? So, once you got that, the canvas, which is your mind, which is always bombarded with, you know, the cat on the lap, or this, oh, she'll go away, or I've got to go to work, and my hips are hurting. It will suddenly be focused on this wonderful feeling because you're enjoying it. You need that feeling. And then the ideas come in. And that's okay. That's fine. Watch them. Watch them. They're great ideas. And those are, you know, beginning of my meditation, I still have them today. And I, when I get very strong ideas, I know, wow, this is what I need to do now. It helps me make up my decisions because I got a message. I feel I just got the message. I got a message. I have to do this. I'm going to listen. I just listen. I've learned to listen to these messages because I have so much faith. And the more you listen, the more faith you have. And now I have a partner called Les, and he meditates one hour every morning. And he comes up every time after a meditation, well, many days, with, oh, I've got this idea to create this music. I've got this idea to make this meditation video of the world, uh, uh, you know, acts of kindness for the world. What, and it just comes through. And then after that, once the idea comes through, then oh, the meditation, he listens, and he is at peace. Because you see, there's no this muddling with other stuff. It's creativity. That's why Gurudev and Beyond Words, in one of the chapters, he so simply said, he and art make heart. So as divine beings, we are here to create whatever it is your dharma to create. I don't know. All I know is that each one has a dharma. I just know. And each one, every single human being I've met has that. And this is where meditation does help you. Because now you're searching for your mission. You're searching for your dharma. You're searching for answers. So your mind is focused on higher things. And then the muddling thoughts, there's no space for them, okay? There's no space for, oh, my hips hurt. Okay, my hips hurt. Make sure before I start, I'm going to sit on a very comfortable chair. If I can't sit on the floor, I'm going to make sure I'm sitting on a comfortable chair. I'm going to make sure that I've got a cushion on my back so that my back stays erect and I don't feel the pressure on it. I'm going to make sure I do some stretches before so, oh, I don't feel stiff, especially in the morning if you feel stiff. I'm going to make sure I do all those things. And it only takes 10 minutes to do that. And then I will sit. But very important, splash cold water in your face. <laughs> Helps a lot. Cold water, boom, on your face in the morning. And if you can, brush your teeth and sit. It would be great. These are things to help you. But uh, let's see. And then, you know, you said here, Louise, I have moments I feel full of peace. When you feel full of peace, just, wow, gratitude. Don't think anymore, gratitude, that's all. <laughs> I had a few moments. You know, there are so many people I see in this world, never done any yoga, never done any of this, and they have no peace. Really, I, my heart breaks for some of the people I see. They never live in peace. And I go, how did I live like that 40 years ago or 30 years ago? God, that's hell. Hell is on earth when you can't live in, in peace. So if you have a few minutes of peace, wow, gratitude. That will make the mind want to meditate more in that situation while you're sitting down. I felt really good for 30 seconds. Oh, thank you. 
then the mind has changed its format of complaining to thank you. Okay, you reinforce it again and again and again, and you create new ways. So um, I like that sometimes really useful ideas come. There are days, like I said, it's creative and it's wonderful. But sometimes it feels like a chore. You know, again, it's sometimes it feels like a chore. Because everybody talks about, oh, I have to get up early, it's a chore, I have to meditate. Change the language. It's not a chore. It's my break time. It's my connection time. It's my time with God. I only got, and that's how I used to do it, I only got 15 minutes. <gasps> 15 minutes. I better not waste it on nonsense. 15 minutes is all I've got. I, then when the mind goes into nonsense, you kind of like, can't do this. I only got 15, and you focus on something that elevates you. You kind of like scare yourself. I only got 15 minutes, and you won't go into nonsense mode. And then it will expand by itself. This is my time to just be me. And watch what's coming up. It's okay to watch it. Who's watching it? You're already meditating. You're watching your mind think. So who are you that's watching the mind think? Who's the witness? Who's the witness? That's already working. Do you see? Something very deep is already going on. It's just that the mind is going like this, but you are watching the mind. So you're already getting in touch with that higher consciousness. You don't think so, but it's happening. It's happening. So don't expect so much. Don't fuss so much and change the language. Language is really important. And fill your heart with love. And there are days, of course, you're very, very tired. Then you can say, okay, today I'm really, really tired. Then you say, instead of doing it so early in the morning, because I, I know I'm just going to not do it. Oh, I know two days you can change. But better to just stick, never mind if I'm tired, I'll at least stick to it. Because again, once the body gets used to a certain habit, like brushing the teeth, whether you like it or not, you're just going to sit on the mat. <laughs> and that's really good. That shows that you've conquered the mind, even though it's tired. So my advice is to stick to it, stick to it, stick to it. So um, that's what I would advise. So how do we move forward from my kind of muddling meditation to Melanie's version? Patience. <laughs> you will get there. Just know it. When, how, don't worry about it. It'll happen when it happens and when these questions stop and you just sit in love you never know what your gift is you never know what your gift is it's just there so louise i hope i've helped you in these questions question number two from jessica how do you all man up yes please i would love if possible a talk on how to help someone very close to you has gone who has gone into a deep dark place and seems to have lots of stress anxiety insomnia negative thinking and he's really suffering can't sit still he questions everything and does not believe anything and this is the problem he does not believe anything he has no faith in anything this is the big problem that's why he's in a deep dark place or she's in a deep dark place she could be so into herself because there's no nothing to believe in there's nothing to hold there's no love to hold so her mind or his mind is so involved in itself. It's so involved in its own problems, its own darkness, its own anxiety, its own insomnia, its own this poor me syndrome, it's in victim mode because it has nothing to hold on to, no love, no faith. So my advice is first thing, if you have 
any um, chance at all is to transmit love to this person. But the truth is, when they're in such a dark place, sometimes they cannot receive it. They just can't. They're not, they're not ready. It's not they don't want to, they really can't. When this happens, when I see people in such a dark place, I sometimes tell them when they say, oh, I just can't, I can't. I say, you know what? Just imagine you're just in a black cloud in a fog now. But one day you're going to get out of it. Absolutely you are. Look forward to that one day when you'll suddenly get out of that black fog. And then I tell them simple lines like, after the rain, there are always rainbows. No rain, no rainbows. And you know, I give them opposites to think without lecturing. Never lecture to somebody like that. It never works. But you accept they're in a dark place because they really feel it. For them, it's so real. For them, it's like, it's, it's, it's like if you really know that you have a pain on your tooth and everybody tells you no. Come on, get off it. You don't have a pain in your tooth. And you really know you have a painful tooth. No matter what they say, you still have your painful tooth. Because it's a mental problem, we tend to judge it too much. And this judgment of get well soon, get over it, will never help them. Patience, and this is hard. And they have to be willing to want to change. They have to see that the problem is themselves. It's all about I, me, my, my, my anxiety. Anxiety does not belong to you. You need to tell them that. State of the mind, you are much more than that. And how do they experience it? One of the best practices that I always say is yoga nidra. Deep relaxation. One of the best practices. You put them in yoga nidra, you guide them with creative visualization, seeing something something so positive, something beautiful. Taking them to seeing their lives, they're laughing, they're, they're, they're getting through their problems and they're really doing it, they can do it, they can do it. And then allow them to listen to the music and feel the peace of the music. And when you can awaken that energy in them, then maybe there's a chance for healing. But lecturing can't work. You can only help but love with love and be the example of love. Give them compassion, not too much too. <laughs> if you keep saying, oh, poor thing, poor thing, poor thing, I'm so sorry you were suffering, that's the other extreme. No, you don't do that too. And if it goes on for a long time, then you can say to them, why are you hurting yourself so much when there's a way out? Why are you hurting yourself when there is a way out? If you want a way, let me help you. And then guide them who to go to. But it's really, really difficult when he or she or somebody is stuck. It's really difficult. Uh, one great practice you can do for them is breathe with them. Tell them, come on, let's do some breathing. All the psychologists today are talking about how great breathing is. It's amazing. Just sit with them and breathe. Well, let's breathe in and breathe out. That you can do. That will help you so much. Let them know. Be positive. It will help you because you know it will. I know definitely it works. So when I tell my patients, I know it works. And then they have faith in me because I really know it works. And they can sense that I know it works. So if you say it works, it works, and it works, and it just works. It works. And I said, well, you have faith in me. You need to learn to have that faith in yourself. That's where you need to bring it. You don't have faith in yourself. You need to have that faith when you are breathing on your own without me around. You can do it. You can. And that's the, the language we have to cha change in these people because it's, I can't, it's not going to happen. I'm never going to change. Do you hear it's language? So teach them how to change their language. Okay, this is really important what you hear from their mouths. I hope Jessica, 
I have answered your question. Uh, message from Beatrix. Dear Anna, thank you so much for asking us. I would be happy to hear our lovely Melanie, thank you, uh, speak about connection with our higher soul and how to make our connection stronger. Let's start, it's, it's a long question, let me read it all first. Also, I heard from Satguru on one of his YouTube talks about yoga asanas and the yoga asanas we know 84. Yeah, he talks about each posture has 84 points. What has to be in perfect line to be able to connect? Also 84 points in our mouth on the palate. What, when we touch with our tongue, we are activating the pineal gland. Any book about this? Thank you so much, you're so welcome. You're so welcome. Okay, let's start with the first one. Our connection to a higher soul and how to make our connection stronger. Uh, I mentioned this already, by filling your heart with love. For me, having a guru really made a difference, having my master made a difference. But nowadays, you know, people feel they can't do that. So think about somebody that elevates you, makes you feel really happy. Of not sunset, uh, the sun, the, the sky, the sea, the expanse of the stars, um, the energy and feel that energy from in you connect upwards. Try to breathe in and feel the energy going up towards higher realms, higher realms. And, you know, they say when you focus on the crown of your head, uh, visions of masters are received. Uh, connection, breathing takes you there. Breathe in so, breathing, breathe in, breathe out hum, so, hum. Or breathe in your mantra, Om Namah Shivaya, and breathe out Om Namah Shivaya. Whatever your mantra is, breathe. Breathe out and feel that energy coming from, I always feel it here where the Chinese say it's the seat of the soul, the solar plexus. And feel the energy rising up, up your Ajna chakra and up to your crown of your head. And feel like, I love to feel that I'm being blessed by thousands of sprinkles of water. And I have to thank somebody who told me that. There was somebody who came to our satsang many, many, many years ago. A day that I was doubting. <laughs> Why am I doing this? Is it all worth it, you know? Uh, should I leave teaching? I'm not making a difference. And somebody who couldn't see too well was at satsang. And when I walked into the room, she said, she was blind and she stopped she just said can you smell the roses and can you feel the drops of water and i funny enough as i was walking in i smelt the roses and i felt drops of water it was really odd and she said those words i don't know where that came from but i knew something Miraculous was happening. And I was so encouraged that I continue teaching. <laughs> I have to thank her. Since then, many times I walk and I feel water when there's no water. <laughs> I feel it on my skin. I feel it. And, um, and she taught me, when you're open and you're full of love, you get blessings. And then when I went to the ashram, I met a wonderful uh, Native American. And he was telling me about all these signs. And while we were driving to the airport to come back home, Ashanti, were you there that trip? You must have been with Vicky as well. Yes, she says yes. And sunny day, middle of the road, we got a huge splash of water on our windscreen. And he said, whoa, 
and this is definitely the blessing of the gods, definitely. I mean, we had that experience a few times with water coming from nowhere. So, and I think a lot of it is to do with my visualizations as well, because ever since that lovely person said that to me, my, you know, many times I just visualize that the water from above and I imagine Lord Shiva with the river Ganga, and that's why Michelle Dumoulin always cries because she's Lord Shiva's river gives and it blesses us and the nectar blesses us. And so anyway, these tears come and they come and they wash away. Um, I personally feel they wash away all the negative and all the sadness and all the sorrows. So this is one of the practices I do. Uh, I hope it helps you, but. And I feel the love of the divine, I do, I really do. I feel it very close to me all the time. There's no question, I have no doubts, I have total faith. I don't see God as a person. I think my guru is just the instrument, human instrument to show me this is possible because without a human example, I would not have known this. When I saw him and his energy field and way of living, and he told me it was possible for us, that's when I understood it. And I understood when he kept saying, now look for it in yourself. I'm transmitting this energy to you. Now I'm giving you the Shakti, receive it, use it. Like a seed and make it flourish. Make it flourish. That's by our effort. Sri Patanjali tells us in the Yoga Sutras, in Sutra 13, book one, effort towards steadiness of mind is yoga, effort. So who makes the effort? Each one of us, we have to put in the effort. It's kind of like this. You know, many people go, oh, they should know that I love them. Is it very easy to say I love you when you do nothing? Oh, my wife knows I love her. Oh, that's why you sit around while she's working like, like a dog feeding you and you just sit there like this. Oh, but I love her. If you love her, you get up and, and see she's tired and help her. How easy to say I love you and do nothing. So easy. And if you love your husband, then why don't you treat your husband like divine? It happens both ways. It happens both ways. Very easy to talk. Real love is by actions. You want somebody tired and it just you can't take it because you, you love them. It's my turn today. I tell say it's my turn today. Not because it's today, but today you look exhausted. Let me take over. I am you, you are me. We are love. And this is what makes the energy go high. So this is the way we work with our internal organs to connect with the divine. Where is the divine? Read the Upanishads, it's everywhere. Up, down, sideways, bum, bum, it's everywhere. So if you can start to say, look at everything as divine, good, bad, good, bad, all divine, it's a movie, it's my movie, and I have to watch it, accept it, get through it, that's it. Be brave, be strong, strong, strong. I can do this, I know. Faith in yourself, faith in yourself. You really need to have faith in yourself. You also need to work on your intellect. Study some very good spiritual books. I would suggest uh, Yoga Sutra of Sri Patanjali, translation by Sri Swami Satchitananda. I would suggest the Bhagavad Gita, the Living Gita. I really suggest them because they lay all my answers. And now I also love the Upan Upanishads by Eknath Ishwaran. And try, you read other stuff, but keep going back to the, the real nitty gritty stuff of meditation. The depth nowadays is, can be a bit superficial. Mindfulness, let's breathe. In, uh, in, uh, yes, one, two, three, one, two, three. Very good. You'll be calmer, you'll be less anxiety. But if you're talking about higher connection, it needs to be a little bit deeper than that. All right? So that's how you can deepen. I can talk about that for hours because definitely bhakti yoga is. I feel you could get there with that. And Beatrix, knowing you, you are bhakti yogi. You really are. 
and you put that in your your hands your work uh, you work with people uh, and the beauty salon you have you already have bhakti you love your patients you're kind to your staff and that's how you connect keep doing that and you will get closer and closer to the divine you've actually are there then you say also i heard from Satguru uh, that he talks about 84 asanas well they say there are 84 asanas to you that you practice and you can do this i'm not a hatha yogi perfectionist for me 12 yoga postures that guru dev taught me are enough yes sometimes you add another 10 for fun etc they're enough for me, but there are many people who are Hatha yogis and their path, they, if they feel is through Hatha yoga, helps them. Hatha yoga is a wonderful practice, but 84 is just the amount of asanas you can accomplish. For me, I'm not so into the body to accomplish. I used to be a dancer for many, many years, and I think I did a lot of work with my body that I've hurt my knees so badly and my neck. That's why I don't do the headstand. And I, I've realized the body is now no longer my way, although I love Hatha Yoga, I do. But I just do like my simple postures. I'm really happy with that. And that's all I need. But other for the Hatha Yogis, yes, you can. You can learn more. And you asked me about a book, and there's one lovely book that somebody gifted me many years ago, and I found it. I, I thought I'd given away, but I didn't. It's, it's this one here. Can you see it? Asana Pranayama Mudra Bandha. And it's all about uh, the whole book of all this. And it's going to write it down and send it to you later. So it's, uh, it's got all the questions about Hatha for Hatha yogis, okay? So it answers many, many things. So that is the... Um... Oh, sure, sure. I can pass you the book. Yes. So that's one of the books. But really also, I was reading what he said. Um, uh, I mean, I was listening to him to see what, where you got that from this morning. I said, Les, can you find me that YouTube where it talks about and found it for me? <laughs> and really what he's saying, really ultimately in the end, you only need one asana to develop asana city. What is asana city? The ability to sit without moving, to sit without moving. So if you can develop even one posture where you can sit without moving for at least two hours, you have developed asana siddhi. Now in Sri Patanjali, he tells us we can get that through asana because when you do Hatha Yoga, you know, all your toxins leave your body, you're moving all the different points in your body, absolutely 100%, and you're working on your um, endocrine system as well, your hormonal system, you're working on everything, your muscles, your digestives, the whole lot, you're working on your cellular system. So um, yes, of course, it can help you. But Asana City really only happens, Sri Patanjali potentially says there's another way to get to asana siddhi and that way is to just focus on one object and stillness can happen to the body so you use the mind to still the body Hatha yogis use the body to still the mind it's not better it's not worse know your personality okay know your personality and follow what is comfortable for you but the goal is to sit still comfortably. The next one is um, Asana City. Is that how you write it? Very good, Rachel. That's how you write it. Yeah. Okay. So then he talks about the mouth palate where we, we touch with our tongue and we're activating the pineal gland. Okay. This, he's talking here about the what we call the Kichari Mudra. K H E C H A R I. <laughs> Got it. <laughs> yeah. Kichari Mudra. What is Kichari Mudra? Kichari Mudra is when you take your tongue all the way back, up behind your palate, stretch it all the way up and back, 
and then you can do the um, and you will feel when you do it if you feel a bit of bitterness first when you do Kachari Mudra know that you're releasing toxins so don't do it for too long just do it for two or three minutes to start. You need to do it slowly, Kachari Mudra. It shouldn't be done without practice. And then eventually over years or months or whatever it is with you, the tongue actually goes all the way back and goes to your nasal pa passage. And that touches the connection to the pineal gland. I do not advise you to practice it alone without the help of a teacher. You can do the basic kachari, which is fine, bringing, rolling the tongue back to the hard palate and then later to the soft palate. And then breathe. Why don't you try it with me now? You'll see there's a taste that comes out. Can you feel it? You got bitter? Have you tried it? Let's try it, try it. And I just said you got a bit of bitter. So let's try it together. Take your, roll your tongue back to the, up to the palate and try to go back towards your throat. Close your eyes. Now breathe in. And breathe out slowly. Breathe in. Breathe out slowly. Stay still for a few seconds. Leaving the tongue up on the palate. Breathe out and open your eyes. So this is, this actually for me, it's better if it happens quite naturally. <laughs> when you go to deep meditation, tongue itself rolls up. And, um, but it helps to uh, conquer hunger and thirst and it helps to keep you still. All right, we do it slowly, little, little every day. And that's what he's talking about. I think that's what he's talking about. I didn't hear that in the talk, but that sounds to me like uh, Kechari Mudra. Also, I, while we're on the subject of the tongue, I need to tell you what I have learned personally myself. Like I told you, I can only tell you what I personally learned. Uh, when my sister had a stroke many years ago, uh, we found somebody in Hong Kong when I was there on holiday. She says, will you take me to this acupuncturist? Sure. And she said, it's a tongue acupuncturist. And I thought, a tongue acupuncturist? I never heard of it. Just tongue. And he said he was going to help her with her. The nerves underneath the tongue apparently connects to the brain. And for me, that sounded really painful. Already she was talking like this right at that time. She's much clearer today. This is a few years after she had her stroke. Anyway, um, I went with her and I was fascinated, fascinated. She had it down like this and he kept on putting these little needles, not for long, because she couldn't hold up her mouth, open her mouth too long. And to stimulate, he was telling me, he was explaining to me, stimulates, uh, there's so many nerves under the tongue that it stimulates the nerves in the brain and starts to, I don't know, he said starts to energize it. So I, I watched that. I went with her to two or three sessions and I did notice it really did help her. So what I started to develop myself after that is, and I think I've told some of my Hatha Yogi students when I used to teach, teach or train Hatha Yoga Basic One. What I started to do is when I go into a shower, you know, I just get it on my tongue on top and, I, and, and at the bottom and I spit out the water, but I let the spray hit the nerve cells, right? on top of the tongue and under the tongue. When you finish doing it, and even if you just spray it on your lips, you feel the whole tingling. It actually feels quite like, poof, you're getting some stuff off, you know? 
you're getting some stuff off. So you can try that. It works for me. This is my own method. Uh, after I saw that, and I, I found it very, uh, uh, you know, I don't know, exhilarating. I felt very exhilarated. After. I do it quite often now. But make sure you've got a good, one of those good shower heads. Like I believe they sell it in Pure Wellness. I'm not trying to advertise. That has the stones that purifies the water. But it's really good. I bought one for me and I really love it. So uh, I think it's really important because we don't know what kind of water today. Uh, so much stuff in it, right? So get a purifier if you can. So I tried this with a tongue. Then the other day, strange Beatrix, you should ask this, quest, ask, ask this question. Remember I told you to read a book called uh, uh, The Brain by David Eagleman because he talks about the brain and the functions. And he was talking about, I, I'm not very sure because I wasn't really, listening so clearly but I remember hearing about the tongue and he said there's a sensory object they put in people's tongue for the mute and the de the mute and the uh, blind I think deaf and dumb sorry I'm not very sure but uh, I remember him saying this that sensory object put in the tongue and we, and when they feel this object they actually have vibrations of sound and really quite interesting it was, it was amazing so I thought so I think, Beatrix, this is exactly what modern technology is learning to do and helping people with disabilities by using these sensory objects on the tongue is fascinating. They also have these sensory objects that they're using for blind people that they put on uh, little caps on their head and also on the spine. Of course, all the places where the nerves gather. So it's uh, really quite interesting. You can, I believe he does TED Talks. So if you're more interested, maybe Google him. I haven't heard his TED Talks, but I would if I had more time. So my work is basically with people in love, so I don't have time to watch too much. But if you have more time, try and see what you can find out. Maybe you can let me know. So from my own experience, yes, the tongue has lots of um, nerve centers, and we are activating our pineal gland. I really believe that because with the shower experiment that I've done myself, I have felt that I feel, um, yeah, I feel really good after that. So, yes. So, but I'm not an expert, and I don't pretend to be, all right? 